Welcome to today's episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. I'm your host, Carrie Flamer Powell, experienced gestational surrogate, surrogacy agency founder, and owner of Surrogacy Mentor, where our aim is to help surrogates match with reputable surrogacy agencies for a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey. Today, I'm excited to have experienced gestational surrogate Betsy King with us today. Welcome, Betsy. Hi, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Absolutely. We always love chatting with other experienced surrogates and getting to understand a little bit more about what happens behind the scenes and what your personal experience looked like. So let's just dive right in. Let's start talking about you, your family, and ultimately what brought you to surrogacy. Well, I, um, I'm actually adopted. And so I grew up always knowing about my adoption and, um, and the, you know, family dynamic around that my family was really open. Um, so I kind of always had this idea of wanting to like give back in some way. Um, and when I was like 18 or 19, I found out about surrogacy that it was like a thing that you could do. Um, and I researched it a little bit and obviously, um, you need to have your own children first. Um, and so I, you know, went to college and I got married and I had my own children. Um, and then I really started to seriously think about it. Um, after my son was born, um, my then husband's cousin was having some fertility issues and I had reached out to her. Um, we were really close and offered, um, to be a surrogate for her. And we talked about like my adoption story and things like that. And she ended up, um, adopting, doing a foster to adopt, um, two beautiful children. Um, and I researched some other organizations and found, um, IARC and really liked what they had to offer. And, um, you know, the staff was really great and they answered all my questions. Um, and I just knew that that was like what I wanted to do. So I, went through the long process of, um, you know, signing up and going through all the medical and the psychological screenings and, you know, got them my medical records and all that stuff. And then I was approved and, um, and yeah, the rest is history. I was matched with, um, a single mom and, um, I had a baby for her back in 2021. Awesome. So let's backtrack a little bit. So tell me a little bit about, um, so you now, like how old are you now? How many kids do you have? What are their ages? And are you currently married? Um, I am 36 years old and I have two children. My son just turned nine in December and my daughter will be turning seven in June. Um, and very busy and we, you know, have a lead a very busy life. I am no longer married. Um, we are married for almost seven years, um, together for nearly 14. And, um, we just decided to, we were better apart than together. So I am single mom in it. Completely understand. Just recently went through a divorce after 18 years myself. So absolutely get it. And you know what? Life changes and sometimes you are better as friends, right? <laughs> um, so tell me about, so you said you delivered in 2021. So tell me when did your journey start, um, your surrogacy journey? So I reached out um, and started the whole process back when my son was six months old. Um, and I went through like an initial interview, but I wasn't ready to be done breastfeeding. Um, and so that delayed my process a little bit. Um, and then when I was still breastfeeding my son, I got pregnant with my daughter. Um, and then and we were living, um, we currently live in the cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul area in Minnesota. Um, we were living in the Fargo-Moorhead area. Um, and 
So I had my daughter and I breastfed her. Um, and then after I was done, um, with my three years of breastfeeding for her, I reached back out to IARC and I had some um, acquaintances through other friends who had gone through the process and I spoke with them. Um, and then once I we got established back down in the cities and then I ended up getting my divorce and then I really dug into the process after that. Um, and I ended up matching with my intended mother in January of 2020, mm -hmm. um, right before the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was very interesting to manage all the monitoring appointments and everything like that during COVID. Um, it looked a lot different than I had originally planned. You know, I thought mm -hmm my children were going to be in school or daycare and that wasn't the case. And so I had, I was very lucky. I had friends that were able to step in and help, um, hang out with them during that time. And, um, yeah. 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 So we definitely, um, I'll definitely dig into the whole COVID experience. Cause that definitely changes things, changed things for everyone in many ways, particularly surrogacy. Um, so from the time you first looked at surrogacy when your son was six months old until the time you were actually matched as a surrogate, how many years was that? Um, let's see, born in 2013. Um, so it was about seven years, seven years. So this is a good reminder to people that surrogacy might not be right for you right now. But if it's something that's truly in your heart and you truly believe that it's something that you want to do and qualify to do, it, there's nothing standing in your way going back later when the time is right in your life. There are lots of criteria, right, to be a surrogate. And a lot of those have to do with um, your life circumstances. Um, are you going through a life change such as a divorce? Or are you breastfeeding? Um, there are things that could be going on in your life that don't disqualify you, but that say not right now. And so the fact that you had it in your heart for seven years and followed through with it says a lot, right? About not only your commitment as a surrogate, but also about the fact that surrogacy is always going to be there. The most important thing is that women choose it when it, the time is right for them, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's very important. And like you said, you know, if it's something that you really feel called to do and it's in your heart, there will be it like it will align and it right. will be the right time eventually. It just might take longer than you would mm -hmm. and like. Right. Absolutely. So let's talk about your journey and kind of what that looked like. So am I correct that you were married at the time that you had your journey, right? Or you um, went through the divorce first? No, I, um, I had gotten the divorce first. Um, our divorce was finalized in May of 2019. Um, and then I matched in January of 2020. So got it. You did say that. So that brings up another great point for our listeners, which is that, you know, there are major life stressors and changes such as divorce where a reputable agency is not going to accept you and pass you. And you're more than likely not also going to pass the psychological evaluation if you are in the midst of a divorce. And that mostly has to do with, it's just a major life change that's unpredictable. Nobody knows how divorces are going to go or not go. We know how we hope they're going to go, right? You and I have both been through divorces. Um, and things are very um, much in the air and sort of turned upside down for a while, even in the best divorces. Mm -hmm. So that does not make for a stable and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Stable enough situation that a psychologist and or agency will be able to say, yes, we feel like you're in a great place to take on this massive um, commitment as a surrogate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing about that, I think is that, um, it's also about legal stuff, right? When it comes to divorce, like let's say it's a nasty divorce and you and your spouse have not 
decided exactly how child support and alimony and all those things are going to work. Well, maybe this, this person that you're divorcing will say, well, she's going to get surrogacy income and I want to use that in the calculations. I should be getting some of that because now, you know, we're still married technically. And so we need to put that in there. And the other thing is also about parentage. Mm -hmm. Um, If it comes down to the fact that you're in the midst of a divorce, you have a baby for someone else as a surrogate, there could be legal ramifications that say that because that person's still your spouse, they have to sign the legal paperwork as part of this surrogacy and or parentage process. And that could really complicate things for making sure that the intended parents are the legal parents of the baby. So those are all the, a few of the many reasons why people should understand, women should understand that um, surrogacy's got to align with a time in your life where you are financially and emotionally stable. And if that means finalizing a divorce first, that's what it means, right? Yes. Yep. And, you know, that's all really great points. And, you know, my spouse knew that it was something I'd always wanted to do. He, he knew that since ever since he met me. Um, and it just didn't align, um, when we were together. Um, but he would have been supportive of that. Um, but then, you know, after it all, after the dust settled, um, it just felt like the right time to do it. Absolutely. And I mean, I think above and beyond any legal or financial stuff, the main point I want to get across is that it's so imperative that women understand how important it is to be emotionally in a place in your life where things are good. Things feel good. They feel stable. You feel supported in your life. And before you take on this massive commitment, right? An emotional journey of just getting pregnant on its own, but then add that whole other legal and emotional layer of this is for someone else. This is someone else's child. So I think it's super important and we can't say enough uh, being in a stable, positive, good place in your life is something that a great agency is going to be making sure of in the very beginning before you're ever even cleared. And then a psychologist will be involved to make sure there's a good mental health screening and counseling. So there's a lot that is done to ensure the mental and emotional safety of the surrogate um, to make sure she's truly ready. Yes. Yep. And the agency that I worked with was very good about that. Um, and also checking in to make sure that I had supportive people um, that I could you know, kind of lean on during the process. And, um, you know, the, the psychologist that I worked with for my psych screening was really wonderful too, very thorough. Um, and so I, I very much felt, um, like the agency and all the pieces really, they did their due diligence to make sure that I was in fact, like, I felt that I was in a good place, but then they also, did their due diligence just to make sure that I really was. It's super important because unfortunately, just like with any industry in the world, there are those agencies um, that are just trying to get people through the system quickly. And it should be a red flag for any women listening. If you're talking to agencies right now and you're telling them, look, you know, I just got divorced or I just filed for divorce, or I'm going through a custody battle right now, or you know, I'm looking at filing bankruptcy or I am in bankruptcy right now. If you're telling them of some of these things that are going on in your life and they're like, it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Let's just keep going through the process. Let's just keep screening you. We'll get you matched. That might seem like, oh, yay, like I'm getting through this process really fast and this is great. But you need to understand those are major, major red flags that are always going to come back to make things super, super difficult for you. So if that's happening, even though it might feel like what you want, it is worth getting a second opinion. And that's part of what we do here at Surrogacy Mentor. And I know that's part of what IARC does is help educate people to help them understand like what is a good, safe, healthy journey and what is one that should bring up your red flags. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And, and, you know, there are several organizations out there and, you know, finding one that fits you. 
So, you know, just finding like the coordinators and things like that, that you really mesh with is so important um, just to make our taking care of during the journey. And it's going to be the best journey, not only for yourself, but for your intended parents as well. Um, Cause it's a big deal. It's a big, <laughs> huge, huge next to having my own kids. It's the biggest decision I've ever made in my life. Yeah, truly my own next to having my own child. It's the biggest decision I ever made in my entire life. Um, so tell me a little bit about why did you choose uh, to work with a single mother? Because that's one of the things that agencies ask is, are you willing to work with single parents? And I would say from my years of owning an agency, um, it is definitely something that a percentage of surrogates will say no to. They want a couple. And mm-hmm. so tell me why you chose to match with a single mom and how was that experience for you? Um, well, when I did my initial, like, who would you want to be matched with? I was very open um, to, you know, heterosexual, homosexual, single parent. I was very open. Just my, I think my biggest draw was people of the most need. And um, for IARC, I think, I think as true as an industry standard as well, a lot of the single people who are looking to have kids tend to be on the waiting list longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, My intended mother's case, she had gone through the process once um, and it was an unsuccessful transfer. Um, And then waited a while after that. And um, we're just kind of sitting on the, on the waiting list and hadn't, had any luck with matching. Um, and so I was really open when they approached me about it. I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, she's been waiting a while and I'd love to, you know, provide her with this. And, um, we had our match call and we clicked very well. She is an international intended parent. Um, and, but, you know, we clicked really well and, um, you know, we seemed to just really like, have that immediate connection. And Mm -hmm. I just knew that it was going to be a really great experience, um, to be able to do this with her, um, and provide her with, you know, not only realizing her dream of, of becoming a, uh, becoming a parent, but also, you know, helping her realize all those hopes and dreams that she had for her child and like watching that come to, come to reality. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And you were a single mom as well. So it was two single moms working together, right? Which is kind of amazing. Yes. So you mentioned that she was international. Was there a language barrier between the two of you? No, nope. There, there wasn't. And we, we Theo chatted about once a month and then we would um, text and I'd share pictures and updates um, through text and emails. So we were in great communication. There were no language barriers. We were very lucky um, with that. Um, I think technology also helps with that too, mm-hmm. being translators and things like that, but I definitely didn't need it. Um, so that w- I think we got really lucky that way too, to help with the bond, because that's definitely an important aspect of the surrogacy process. I think for a lot of people, they want to have that friendship and that community with their intended parents and the intended parents, you know, want that too. And uh, being able to form that bond, especially when you're not living in the same state or city and it can be difficult, but yeah, we got really lucky. That's awesome. And, you know, I just want to make the point that there's no right or wrong answer when it comes to who a surrogate is willing to match with. It's just understanding what is the best fit for you and your particular situation. I would say that the majority of surrogates are very open and are willing to carry for anyone that they click with, that they feel good about, that feels good about them. Um, But you will be asked by an agency in the very beginning, who are you willing to carry for? And that list, as you mentioned, will include uh, single parents, heterosexual, homosexual, um, you know, all the different international and local. 
And a lot of surrogates, I think, go into it thinking, well, I want someone who's a lot like me, who lives in my same town. <laughs> and um, they realize that that's not always going to be their best match. And the more, oh, I always tell people, the more open you are, whether it's parents or surrogates, the more open you are, the more chance you have of finding the right match for you. Um, it's so important to realize that there could be opportunities that you're missing if you narrow down that choice too much. So there's nothing wrong with going into it with a wish list of who you'd like to work with, right? But um, taking the advice of your agency when it comes to who might be a good match, there's nothing wrong with having a conversation or looking at a profile just to see how it might feel to chat with them, right? Yeah, exactly. And honestly, I mean, some it, it sometimes takes a little while to find that couple or that, you know, intended parent match that you really click with. And I think especially, you know, from what I've seen as a program coordinator and then through like surrogacy chat groups and things like that, like people are just so excited to match and to be able to have those conversations with their intended parents that they go into it being like, oh yeah, this is going to be the one. Um, and then when they get off the call, they, they're, you know, there might be a little bit of something that just wasn't right. And just being patient and saying like, okay, well, like, let's, you know, look at another profile or kind of see and have that patience. Mm -hmm. Um, because really, as you go through the journey with your intended parents, it's a lot like, a relation, like a romantic, like you're dating, like you get to there and you form that bond. And, you know, sometimes you really click and sometimes you click in the beginning. And then by the end, it's not as, you know, it's just, it didn't, gr the relationship didn't grow the way you thought it would. Other times it starts off and it's kind of awkward and whatever, but then by the end, you're best friends and, you know, mm -hmm you stay involved in that person's life forever. It really just depends. And I think the more, like you said, open you are and just like honest with yourself too. Mm -hmm. um, and having boundaries and patience is really important. I agree. Absolutely. So let's talk about um, your support network and how as a single mom, who was your support network? Who were the people that you relied on for support? Because we talk a lot about needing a support network of family, friends, spouse, whatever it is um, around you as a surrogate. You can't do all of this alone, right? So what did that look like for you? And how did they react knowing that you were going to be a surrogate? Um, well, wanting to be a surrogate for so long, pretty much all the close people in my life were very excited when I was able to start moving forward with the process. Um, I, I have a couple of friends, um, one of which who I I've been friends with since I was very, very young. Mm -hmm. Um, I was willing to step in and, um, help out when I had my appointments and, um, just making sure that my kids had a safe place to be, um, you know, we did a lot of social distance, what, like where they'd be in the backyard and masked up and, um, and different things like that with COVID. But, um, she was amazing. She I, honestly, like, I could not have proceeded forward had it not been for her and her willingness to, to step in and, um, you know, help out in that way. And then I had a, um, another friend who came with me um, for the transfer and, you know, was there to help support during that time as well. Um, and she was the one that came with me and was in the hospital with me during the birth. Um, and so she was amazing as well. Um, and, and then, you know, I, my dad helped out with childcare while I was in the hospital, um, as did a few other friends as well. So I was very lucky to have a lot of support and people who were, you know, willing to, to put a pause on the things that they needed to do to be able to step in and help me, um, with my childcare needs and travel and being in the hospital and things like that. So that's great. And that's so important. And that's, again, one of the questions that a surrogate applicant will be asked by the agency and the mental health providers is, 
what does your support network look like? How do they feel about you being a surrogate? Um, do you have people that can take your kids um, if there's an emergency or just an appointment you need to go to? And what's it going to look like if you are on bed rest and you need like a lot of support? Who are the people around you that are going to be able to help? And it's super important that you have that just for any pregnancy, but particularly a surrogacy pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So that's great that you were able to have that. Um, you mentioned being masked up and social distancing. So we do have to revisit and frame this experience in light of COVID, which you said you matched in January, 2020. And then it would have just been a couple months after that, that the world all experienced together COVID. Um, and I remember very clearly as an agency owner at that time, how that changed the industry immediately, um, because everything to do with surrogacy and pregnancy revolves around IVF, fertility clinics, OBs and doctor appointments, right. And hospitals and Mm -hmm. all of those things were completely turned upside down. So let's just briefly talk about what did that look like for you, particularly having an international intended parent and not knowing when or if they'd be able to get into the United States for the birth. So talk to me about that. Yeah. So, um, when we, when we matched, um, you know, we, every, we were good and we were talking about the timeline and everything like that. I ended up transferring in October of 2020. Um, so we had been in it for a while. Um, and you know, but she was amazing. She would send, um, like PPE supplies to me and things like that, just to make sure that I was, you know, as healthy as possible. Um, I was very cautious on like travel to my like transfer. Um, and like leading up to that, I think like just, and I think the anxiety level of carrying during that time was a lot higher. Um, because with a pregnancy, you want to be protective, but especially when it's someone else's baby, like, I feel like there's just this extra level of protection. So, um, you know, my kids and I would quarantine, um, and just make sure that we weren't seeing people. Um, we would wear masks and do a lot of social distancing. Um, and then, you know, once the pregnancy happened, we were very cautious about who we were seeing and where we were going, always masking. Um, And then being international, like she was very worried about not being able to get here. Um, Luckily, you know, we had come up with a plan and she was able to get here. However, I ended up delivering early. And so she did unfortunately missed the birth. Um, and, but she didn't have any problems getting into the country. Um, and I think, you know, she was here for a couple months after, and then when she went back home, um, it was definitely an undertaking to, to get home with, with the baby. Um, and they had to quarantine before getting back into the city, um, for 21 days. And Mm, so it, it was, like a lot of moving pieces. And I think in our case, it worked out really well and it all kind of went, went together. I know for surrogates who are pregnant and then delivered in like March, April, May, there were a lot of, you know, do, are the intended parents going to be able to be in the hospital? You know, if it's an international family, are they going to be able to get here? Who's going to take care of the baby if they aren't able to get here? There were a lot of different moving pieces, but we were really lucky that everything had kind of calmed down enough to where there were hurdles, but they just weren't as high. (laughs) Right. And everything you're talking about just makes me think about the thousands of decisions that had to be made and however many people had to be involved on the agency side, legal side, medical side to get all of these things to line up and make sure they were, everyone was protected and taken care of legally and medically during all of this. It 
we just recently did a blog post about independent versus agency journeys. And it's no secret for those that listen to my podcast that even though I did an independent journey, I've owned an agency and I've done hundreds of journeys and I know what could go wrong. And I know the, the literally thousands of things that are constantly being handled behind the scenes. Um, the logistics alone are just mind blowing that have to be handled by an agency to make sure a journey goes off without a hitch, let alone during COVID and international matters that have that come into play during that. So it's just another, you know, point on the chalkboard in my mind for why you should be working with an agency because think about doing an independent journey, even without COVID, just think about all the things that you'd have to make sure were done and done well, and then checked and rechecked and then throw in something like COVID or even half as serious as COVID any complication, just throw it in there in the mix and watch how all of those pieces start getting more and more complicated, right? It's yep. just really scary to think about all the things that could have gone wrong in my independent journey. And I think a great agency makes such a difference, which is why we do what we do. And you actually work for the agency that you went through, right? And so Thank what you. do you do there? Um, I am a program coordinator. So after an intended parent and um, surrogate match, I coordinate the program from from the contract signing to the medical screening to the, you know, the monitoring appointments to transfer and then birth and post-birth and until everything is wrapped up. So you're the juggler of all those thousands of things I was just talking about. Yes. Yep. yep. That and the <laughs> team that we work with is phenomenal. And, and really, like you said, there are so many moving pieces that you don't even necessarily think about as a surrogate that you that have come to light now that I'm a program coordinator and just like seeing it from the surrogate side and then seeing it from the program coordinator side, there's so many pieces and I, to have to manage that on your own on top of being pregnant is just, you know, I think working with an agency is such a valuable experience um, to not have to. And all the legal side of things is really important. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny, um, almost every employee that I ever had at my agency and that I currently have at my current company have been surrogates before. And it was so funny because we would have surrogates that did two, three journeys as surrogates. And then they'd come to work for us and they'd say, I had no idea what was going on behind the scenes and how many moving parts there were and how many things there were to worry about or to think about or to be doing. I, I am seeing it from a whole new light now that I'm working for an agency and so it's just something to think about if you're considering an independent journey. Again, there's no right or wrong. There's just um, education and safety and bearing those things in mind. If you are someone who can manage a, an extremely complicated long-term project and be pregnant for someone else and take care of your own kids and possibly manage your own part or full-time job that you might have, go for it. Just know that there's a lot of people's safety and well-being and financial, you know, considerations that have to be taken into account. And it's a lot. It's a lot on your brain, <laughs> as you know, as a program coordinator. Yes, absolutely. So tell me about some advice that you would give to women who might be listening, who are thinking about becoming surrogates, but aren't quite sure if it's right for them, or maybe they're a little nervous about taking that first step, what would you say to them? Um, I think the biggest advice that I would give is just like reach out and have that initial conversation. I think a lot of the nerves that happen is just from like the unknown. And once you have that conversation, wonderful podcasts like yours, talking to agencies, um, you know, reaching out and having conversations with surrogates who've been 
gone through the process to kind of let you know and answer your questions very like candidly, I think is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. And finding an agency, if you choose to do the agency route, that feels right and feels good. Um, And, you know, like I said, when I first started my research, I I had that initial conversation with um, one of the surrogate coordinators at IARC and she was delightful and she answered all my questions and brought up some things that I hadn't even thought about um, as things to think about and really, you know, think about how I'd feel about this certain thing or, you know, and I, that was really helpful. Um, because I think sometimes you just go into it and you're like, well, I'm going to be a surrogate. I'm going to get pregnant and like a baby, but you know, like with any time there's pregnancy involved, like maybe the transfer doesn't take, or there's a miscarriage or, you know, there's multiples and, you know, we have to think about selective reduction. There's just a lot of things that I don't necessarily think you go in thinking about. Mm -hmm. Um, And though that initial conversation is really helpful to kind of get your brain moving, like, oh, how would I feel about selective reduction? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not my baby, but it's my body um, and different pieces like that. And having conversations with surrogates who've been through the process has been really helpful, too, I think. Um, And just keeping realistic expectations for yourself and your intended parent. I think sometimes people go into it with this really like idealized idea of what they want. And I think that's wonderful that you can have that idea of what you want your journey to look like and the relationship with your intended parents, but then take a step back and think about, well, what was life like for me after I had my first baby and I was taking care of a newborn or what was life like for me when I was pregnant with my own kids? You know, what was my capacity and being clear about those boundaries for yourself and, and just being like understanding of your intended parents too. Um, I think that's really important. I think that is all really great advice. I think that it's kind of like before you go to the doctor to get a shot or, you know, a procedure, it's often the thinking about it that's more uh, troubling and scary than an actual shot, right? And I know that at least for me, for my first surrogacy shot, that was the case. I cried for like two hours before I could actually give myself the injection. And then I did it and I was like, oh my gosh, that was so nothing. So I think you make a good point that sometimes it can be kind of mysterious and we make up a lot of things in our heads about what surrogacy is or isn't, or we're just going to be rejected. And so why even bother? Or, you know, all of these things just have the initial conversation and reach out to, you know, a great agency that you've researched online or surrogacy mentor, which is literally what we do is help people find the right agency and answer questions and educate, reach out, have the conversation. I think people will see, like you said, that it's so much better after you have a real realistic picture of what to expect and what's really involved. So that's hopefully part of what we've done with this conversation and give people a peek into, you know, a realistic journey. And I just really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Carrie. It was amazing to be able to speak with you and be here today. Absolutely. We appreciate it very much. And so that brings us to the end of this episode of the Normalized Surrogacy Podcast by Surrogacy Mentor. Again, I'm your host, Carrie Flamer Powell, and I want to again thank our very special guest, Betsy, with IARC Surrogacy for joining us for this chat today. Be sure to check us out online at surrogacymentor.com. If you're interested in knowing whether surrogacy might be right for you, take our easy two-minute quiz on our website. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to learn more about gestational surrogacy and how to have a safe, ethical, and enjoyable surrogacy journey. Talk to you next time.